4. Approaching the first insight. Awareness of consciousness and object. It is nice to see you coming here, learning Dhamma. Seeing you meditating makes me feel very happy. You want to be joyous, and of course we all want to be joyous and satisfied, we are looking for satisfaction, we are trying to look for satisfaction all our life. If you really ask have I found anything really satisfying, lasting, which gives me lasting satisfaction? Most of us will say no. We do one thing after another and we feel satisfied for a brief period, maybe a few hours, maybe a few days, and after that, that satisfaction is gone. If you want to be joyous, satisfied and fulfilled, that is the most difficult thing to do, to be fulfilled, to be full, to be filled, not wanting any more, not lacking anything any more, to be fulfilled is the opposite of to feel empty. Fulfilled is full and filled, to feel full to be satisfied, be in touch with the spiritual part of yourself. Don't go and look for something out there to make you feel fulfilled. We need many things to survive, to live, to be healthy. But to feel fulfilled, don't go out and look for things out there. Nothing out there will make you feel fulfilled. The only thing that can make you feel fulfilled is to get deeply in touch with your spiritual nature. Very noble nature very beautiful nature. We human beings have two different natures so to speak, lower nature and higher nature. If you study Abhidhamma you will find that there are two different categories for the mental factors. One is beautiful, and the other is not beautiful. We have both of those qualities. Let's say selfishness is not beautiful but generosity is very beautiful, hurting other beings is not beautiful, restraint is very beautiful, Unmindful is not beautiful. If you look into your mind you'll see that, when you are unmindful the mind is very agitated, going here and there, like a homeless person, going around, going nowhere, living here and there, doing things that are not healthy. When the mind is not mindful it feels like a homeless person, very insecure, very unhappy. When you are mindful, you feel really at home. So. Mindfulness is my home. When you are mindful you are at home. When you are not mindful you are on the road going nowhere. Get in touch with the spiritual part of yourself. The beautiful part of yourself, be mindful. If you want something badly enough there is a way to get it. This means, if you really want to be mindful there is a way to do it, not difficult, if you really want to be mindful. We need to make very clear our object or goal. Do you really want to be mindful? Unless we become more and more mindful there is no way to feel happy, joyous, or fulfilled. The world is a place for opportunities. Yes, it is an opportunity to be here, to be in this human world as a human being. When I read some of the stories about bodhisattvas, I found that bodhisattvas don't want to live in a place which is perfect. Why is that? I think it is quite easy to guess. You have nothing to learn. Everything is perfect. Deliberately they go to places where they face difficulties. When I read about Buddha and his cousin who gave him a lot of trouble, who was that? Devadatta, he gave a lot of trouble to Buddha. I am very grateful towards Devadatta just for doing that. It might sound very paradoxical, why is that? Because of Devadatta we know more about the good qualities of the Buddha. Otherwise how would we know? In some ways he made it possible for Buddha to manifest and show his perfection. This world is a very good place to learn. Because there are so many difficulties and imperfections. The world is a place for opportunities and I look forward to opportunities for learning and growing. Every difficulty is an opportunity for learning and growing. If you really understand this one thing, you'll never is feel that your life is meaningless no matter what happens. Whether things are going well or whether things are going badly, you can always learn something and grow and actually we learn and grow more when we face and overcome those difficulties properly, in a proper way. If we react to difficulties and make more unwholesome actions, then we don't learn we don't grow. Difficulties are opportunities to learn. To grow and to become a better person. If you see your life as a long learning process, nothing that happens in your life will be meaningless. Everything will be meaningful. 
That is what we are doing here, to be mindful all the time, all day, seeing, hearing many things and our minds reacting. Just from watching how our minds react to all these experiences. Just by doing that we learn and we grow. Start thinking about yourself as a lifetime student at a large university, your curriculum is your total relationship with the world you live in, from the moment you are born to the moment you die. It is an informal school. Each experiment is a valuable lesson to be learned, and each experience also is a valuable experience to be learned. The trick is simply to make whatever place you are in, your educational forum. Learn everything you can about yourself and the world around you. Actually this is true education, to learn about yourself and to learn about the world around you and the relationship between you and the world. The world includes everything living and non-living. This is the highest education. Now we know that our object of meditation is Paramatha which is the natural quality of mental and physical phenomena. Let's take for example, seeing, everybody has sight, everybody sees but a meditator sees things very differently. What do you do when you meditate, awareness of seeing, you look at something and you are totally in touch with that without thinking about it. This is very important, without thinking about it. Thinking is not vipassana, it could be samatha, be very clear about these two things. Some people read about meditation and they say when you meditate you think about something. Yes, this is one type of meditation which is samatha, like metabhavana, you think about people and you think about your loving thoughts. Buddhanasati bhavana also, you think about Buddha and his qualities and when you get absorbed in the qualities of the Buddha, your mind automatically is in that quality and it has that quality somehow, to a certain extent. Even with metta. Sometimes when you develop metta, and you get used to doing that and sometimes even though you don't think about anybody or any thoughts you feel some sort of feelings of love. You can get into that state, that is a higher state of metta actually, you don't think about it anymore but you feel it. You feel very warm, kind, soft and generous. So. There is a kind of meditation in which you think, and there is another kind of meditation where you don't think, and vipassana is not thinking. But we are so used to thinking that even when we are practicing vipassana, in between, thoughts come in again and again, even about vipassana or about other things. We comment on our experience. There is something in our mind which likes to comment, a commentator, like when you watch the news or a movie, there is somebody talking explaining what is happening, it is like that in our mind. Our mind is always explaining things. This is this, this is good, and that is bad. A commentator is always commenting in our mind. You are meditating and things are going well and the thought comes, oh, it is so nice now, things are going so well. When we meditate, we need to know that we don't need to think, thoughts will come, but do not encourage thinking no matter how beautiful. Sometimes when I was a beginner meditating, such beautiful thoughts came into the mind, one thing after another, with very beautiful connections, very interesting connections. I got so attached to these Dhamma thoughts that I could not let them go. I loved them, I wanted to remember these thoughts, but that became a big hindrance. When I meditated together with my friends, many of them are not so intellectual and don't read many books, they read some Dhamma books, but they don't read much about any other subject and they don't think so much. And especially because when I was young, I wanted to write articles, thoughtful articles, good Dhamma articles, because of that ambition, aspiration, when I meditated beautiful Dhamma thoughts would come in my mind and I cannot let them go. I want to write them down. Because of that reason it took me much longer than all my friends, who were not very well educated who were not intellectuals. They developed deeper samadhi and got in touch with the reality and developed very deep samadhi. Sometimes I felt very ashamed, these people who have no education are doing better than me. Competition starts coming into the mind, he is doing better, and I am not doing as well. When we went to see our teacher, the teacher would ask me how is your meditation, nothing very special I said but I feel happy. I didn't have anything to say apart from feeling a little bit happier. Once, a very simple and clear insight came into my mind, 
which was that I was always afraid of something. My mind became very calm and peaceful for a few moments, and after that I could remember I had never felt that peace before in my life. It was not a deep insight, not any kind of nana, knowledge, actually, it was just calmness, mindfulness, totally mindful, calm and very much at ease, not thinking about anything, not thinking about the future or the past, but right in the moment, very calm and peaceful for a few moments only. When I came out of that state, I knew that I had never felt this peace before. All my life I was afraid of something. I was afraid of not becoming a successful person, not loving, not being loved, many fears. Sometimes it is very vague, you cannot even talk about it but you feel it, you are carrying fear. Anyway, when we meditate, we don't think, when a thought comes, we just acknowledge that thought and let it go. Later when you practice another kind of vipassana, siddhanupassana, you can look into that, but for beginners, do not follow thoughts, because if you follow thoughts it will go on and on. For example, when we are seeing something, what do we really see? We see only colors, and this color is the reaction of our retina. Scientifically explained, it is the reaction of our retina which our brain interprets as color. So what is it that comes into and strikes the retina? That is Rupa. Rupa is not out there, and we don't know what actually is really there. When we see, it is something happening in our eye, also in our brain and in our mind. They are all connected together. It is photons with different energy, different frequency to which our nervous system reacts and produces different intensities of electrical impulses and that creates color. Those who are color blind, although you show them different colors, they cannot see all the colors, and they will see only a few shades of color. The colors are there so to speak, but they don't experience color. What we mean by color or what we mean by seeing, is our experience, not something out there, try to understand this idea. What we see is our experience only, we don't really see something out there. There might be something out there, there is something out there, which is the basis for our experience but we don't really know what that is. We experience something falling on our retina and there is a reaction, the retina produces some impulse and the nervous system carries that impulse into the brain. With the brain in connection with the mind, we interpret. It is very difficult to explain about these things. When we see a human being that is an interpretation of our mind, not of our eye, the eye does not know anything beyond color. The Buddha gave a very concise meditation instruction. When seeing only seeing, Dihi Dhamata Bhavas Sati Adnate. There is only seeing, nothing added, no interpretation. When we meditate, that is what we try to do, we try to be aware of what we see. In the beginning thoughts will be going on, this is beautiful, this and nice. After a while as you watch these thoughts coming, they will slow down, slow down, and then they stop. When you stop thinking in the beginning you don't feel like you are experiencing anything, the experience becomes very vague, without thoughts. It becomes meaningless, actually it is meaningless. We create meaning, at a certain level it is important for us to create meaning, but when we are meditating vipassana, we are trying to experience something which is beyond normal experience, not normal reality, natural but not normal. We create meaning, we interpret, and actually we understand our own interpretation. When we understand something, it is our own interpretation. We agree our interpretation with many people. You interpret something in a certain way and I interpret something in a certain way. We have an agreement there, and we think yes, that is it but actually it is just agreement on interpretation. We don't really know what is out there. We just agree on interpretation. When we meditate, we become very simple. The mind becomes extremely simple. Thinking is very complicated. Without thinking, experiences, sense impulses, become very simple. We go down to that simple level. We just look at something without thinking about it. If I look at the carpet like this, without thinking, then when thinking stops I am aware of what I see, which is color and patterns, even the pattern is a kind of put together and I don't think about carpet anymore. Then there is no carpet anymore. 
There is only what I see. There are only different colors, no carpet anymore. When you get to that level, you are in touch with Paramatha. For a beginner it is not so easy to do. So when we see something we are aware of the object so to speak, coming in the eyes and when you stop thinking and become more and more aware of it, you become aware of this awareness which is aware of this object. There is something which knows that something is there. You become aware of awareness. This is very important. Only then the process becomes complete. The object, you are aware of the object and you are aware of the awareness of the object, two things going on. This will happen slowly. This is what we are trying to do. For a beginner when you see something, immediately the mind starts interpreting it oh, this is nice. I like this, this is beautiful. It could be a painting or an apple, a car, a man, or woman, anything. Immediately you see that you have interpreted. What do you do when that happens? You don't get upset. Immediately when that thought comes you are aware of it. If we don't like something, when the thought comes, I don't like this, this is terrible, immediately you are aware of that thought, not liking, aversion, disappointment. It goes on like that, it will go on for a long time, you interpret, you react, you interpret, you react, but if you stop interpreting you won't react anymore. Keep doing that for a long time until you stop reacting and interpreting. You'll see that there is only the object and there is the awareness. After a while you will see that because of this object this awareness happens. You shut your eyes, you are aware of something else, you can see some sort of vague image in your eyes, but you are not aware of whatever is out there. Although your memory tells you that there are a lot of people sitting there, about 60 people sitting there, but that is your memory saying it. When you shut your eyes you are not aware of that object anymore. You open and suddenly there is awareness. This awareness is conditioned by this object, this object, this awareness. Also when you turn around you can see that, because of this awareness, awareness of the object happens. Without this awareness you cannot see that there is an object, you cannot know that. You look from both sides, sometimes you look at the object and see that there is an object and this is awareness. Because of the object there is awareness and because of awareness you can tell there is an object. You are aware of the awareness too. How does this object affect your mind? When you see something beautiful it attracts your awareness, it attracts your consciousness, you want to see more, you don't want to turn away, you want to be with that object, with that sensation. You know that, these images, these rupas, matters, attract the consciousness, so you turn your mind to the object. It is the mental factor, which in Abhidhamma is called Manasakara, which turns your mind, gives you a direction. So you know that because of the object, the mind turns to the object. When you cannot see something clearly, you try to look. There's something there. What is it that is making you look like this? Attraction of the object the mind, the consciousness is attracted to the object. You know that this object has some power. It attracts your consciousness. Whatever happens in the whole process, try to be in touch with it. Try to do it again, close your eyes, there is no awareness of an object out there, you open your eyes, and if you do that a few times very mindfully, you'll find that as soon as you open your eyes something happens in your mind, immediately the awareness appears. You experience that immediate appearance of the awareness. We are in the habit for doing it for so long that we don't really know that. When I do that, I sit in a chair looking outside into the forest and the hill, keep my eyes opened and I try to get in touch with this awareness of seeing, aware of the object, aware of the colors. Then I close my eyes it disappears. The object disappears and the awareness disappears. We tend to believe that although we close our eyes there is somebody inside who was aware of it and who is still there. We give it continuity. When we do that very mindfully, we close our eyes, the object disappears and the consciousness disappears. Then another consciousness is arising there, another one, a new one. As I told you last week, everything happening in this world is always new. 
All the conditioned phenomena are always new. Nothing is old. Always new, means always arising and passing away. Because if it does not pass away, it cannot be new. It has to be old. If something stays for a long time it becomes old. To say that something is always new. It means that it arises and passes away. To be new means to arise and to pass away. What happens when I keep my eyes opened? Is the consciousness always there? No, it is not always there, it is arising and passing away so quickly that we think that it is always there because it is the same type of consciousness. Because the type is the same, we have the feeling that it is the same. It is not the same, just the type is the same. The two things are very different. After you practice for a long time you come to experience this, this awareness itself that is arising and passing away has a gap between. For a beginner it is not easy to do this. After you practice meditation for a long time, many days, you can experience that there is a gap always there. When you see things like this it appears very solid, but when you become more and more mindful you don't experience solidity anymore. Everything becomes shaky and moving. Our retina also is always on and off, on and off, going like that, and then you become aware of something happening inside your eyes. It is like watching a television tube, dots arising and passing away. You become more and more aware of that. Some people when they get to that stage complain that there is something wrong with my eyes, I can't see things clearly, I cannot focus my eyes. If that happens to you, just remind yourself that this is natural to happen. As we become more and more mindful, things that we don't normally feel become very obvious. It is the same with hearing. When we sit and meditate, we should learn to meditate with open eyes as well, but for a beginner it is better to close the eyes. Buddha taught meditation of hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling and feeling on the body and thoughts also. All six, nothing left out. Train yourself to be mindful of all these six senses. But for a beginner it is good to keep the eyes closed. When you sit you can't switch off your hearing, you hear sounds. In the beginning you interpret them, this is a truck, this is a man talking, and this is somebody walking there. You interpret that. Whenever you interpret you react, you don't like that somebody walking, somebody talking so loud, it is so noisy here, so many cars going by on the road, what shall I do now? all sorts of thoughts coming in the mind. Just be aware of thoughts coming in the mind, and see that you are interpreting and commenting. When you become more and more mindful of the reaction, of the interpretation of your mind it will become less and less. After a while, the moment you start interpreting and reacting you are aware of it and it stops. After doing that for a few times you stop reacting. For a while you hear something but you don't interpret. If you don't interpret for a very long time, something strange happens again. It seems that you are not experiencing things very well. Your experience, it is not strong anymore. Because of our thoughts we experience something more intensely. So when we stop thinking and just become aware of it we don't really feel anything anymore. What I mean to say is that, things don't have intensity anymore. Even with pain. Say you have pain in your knee when you are sitting and meditating, the more you react the sharper it becomes. When you stop thinking about it and just be in touch with it, without trying to do anything, not trying to overcome it, not interpreting it, just being with the pain, after a while you feel that the pain becomes vague, it is not as painful as before. Our thinking process makes the sensations stronger. When you stop thinking and just get in touch with it, it becomes so vague that we feel that something is missing. We want to take hold of something. For example, if you have a big round ball, can you hold it with one hand? You cannot. It is a big round slippery ball. But if you put a handle on it you can grab it by the handle. The name, the tag, the interpretation is just like the handle. With the handle we grasp things very strongly, we won't let it go but, Without that handle everything is slippery, you can't hold to it. When you stop thinking, you get in touch with it, you can't grasp anything anymore. It becomes slippery and vague, that is the way it should be. 
so, stop interpreting the sounds, get in touch with it and you'll know that because of that sound there is hearing going on. Where does hearing happen? In the beginning you feel that hearing happens in your ear. You can even feel the sound waves hitting your ears. You can really feel it. When you become very sensitive you can even feel the sound waves on your body skin, not only on your ear, but it comes and touches your skin. You become very sensitive to sound and after a while it is very painful as well. One of my friends who is a good meditator and also a doctor, I think that doctors work very hard and because of this they get into the habit of working hard. In fact to become a doctor you have to work hard and when they meditate they work very hard as well, said that when I meditated at first I thought there is a sound out there, he lives in a very crowded area where there is a lot of traffic, just like here, also on a corner, and the sound is coming to me, and I feel it in the ear. Later he thought the sound is happening in the ear and later after a while he noticed that the sound is happening in the mind. He could feel it in the mind. Your consciousness of the sound and the object itself, they touch each other, you feel the impact, the object and the consciousness touching each other. Try to do that. Be very mindful of the noise, the different kind of sounds. Don't think about it. In the beginning you will feel that there is a sound out there. After a while you will find there is a sound happening in the ears. After a while again you will feel that it is in the mind. Without mind you cannot experience anything at all. Because of this awareness arising you feel. You experience sound. Try to experience the whole process, and in that process you might react with liking or disliking, so be aware of that too. I like this sound, I don't like this sound. Whenever you react like that be aware of that too, this is nice to hear, this is so terrible, it is so painful to hear this sound. Normally our eyes don't experience pleasant or unpleasant sensation. The eyes experience only neutral sensations. But, when we see we interpret and when we like it we feel happy, when we don't like it we feel unhappy, that is not eye consciousness, that is mind consciousness. When we don't interpret that way, when we stop where the eye consciousness stops, we don't experience any pleasure or displeasure. Everything becomes neutral. When we see something there is nothing pleasant or unpleasant. Only the interpretation makes it pleasant or unpleasant. When we see something very bright like welding it is very painful to the eyes. The question arises whether this is an eye object which is painful or rupa which is painful. Actually it is not the retina which is interpreting the pain, it is another part of the body which feels the pain. The same thing happens with the ear. It is aware of the sound only, not the pain but they are all together in the same place. They are all homogeneously mixed. Try to understand these things very clearly because these are the classical commentaries that I want to give explanation of. When you meditate, you don't need to think about these things. Only now try to understand what happens. When you meditate you don't think and try to understand. You just get in touch with it directly. The same thing with your nose, with smell, for example when you sit and meditate sometimes, you smell something burning because mostly in the meditation hall we burn incense. Some people like it and some people don't like it. You feel the smell and then you think about it. This is sweet, good, and sometimes when you don't like it you say these people like this terrible smell. Why do they burn these things? It is not good for your lungs, you start thinking. When you start thinking like that, be aware of that thought, liking and not liking is our interpretation. We are conditioned to liking something, we are conditioned to not liking something, and so, it is our conditioning. If you really feel that it is not really good for your lungs some people are allergic to smell then you can sit in some other place. The important thing is not to react, not to interpret. When you smell something, you are just aware of it, because of this smell there is this consciousness, because of this part of your body which is sensitive to smell this consciousness arises. Object, sense base and consciousness, you can be aware of all these three, in your meditation, but don't try to think of these three different things. Any of these three you can be aware of and if you are aware of one it is enough. Don't try to see all these different things. For some people, it is easy to see one aspect of it, 
another person will see another aspect of it but it is the same process. As long as you are aware of one aspect of it, it is enough. If you try too much you get agitated, you start thinking about it. The same thing with your body. You feel something on your body. Be in touch with it without interpreting it. Normally when we sit and meditate we don't taste anything particularly. Sometimes we might feel sour taste in our mouth but not very obviously, so it is not really important. But when we eat, if it tastes good we like it, and when it doesn't taste good we don't like it. There is a reaction going on. We get the smell of the food we like it or we don't like it. Normally when we sit in the meditation hall there is no eating, we don't need to do that. We feel something on the body all the time. For example, when we breathe in and out that is a kind of feeling sensation, very gently the air rushes into your nostrils and it rushes out of the nostrils, there is some sort of sensation going on there. So, we get in touch with that sensation, without thinking about it, it may be long, it may be short, but the main object is to be aware of the whole process. In the suttas it is said, when you breathe in long you know that you are breathing in long, Tgavasasantu, Tgavasasamti Pajanati MNI.56. If you read that, it sounds that you have to think about it I am breathing in long, I am breathing out long. If you try to do that you'll get agitated, you are doing too much. For a beginner it is helpful just to say breathing in, or just in and feel the whole breath from beginning to end. Feel it, don't think about it. When you really stop thinking and start being in touch with it, immediately the mind shifts into another kind of mode. A different mode, in your television you have many different modes. The mind has also a different mode of working. Whenever we use a word we are functioning in this ordinary reality. When we stop using any kind of word or any kind of shape or image, our mind works in a different mode and in meditation we are working in a different mode. We try to understand things in a different way, not in the normal way that we used to. As soon as you use a word you are bringing your mind back to the ordinary way of working and seeing. This happens in the beginning of meditation. We cannot eradicate it immediately. Whenever it happens, become aware of it. Also, thinking, labeling, naming is useful for a beginner but after a while we have to let go of it. Just like using a walking stick when you walk. When you feel weak you need something to support you, a walking stick or even a rope. Some people who are disabled, or with some injuries when they are rehabilitating, learning to walk again, they need to hold on to something so that they won't fall down. They hold on the rope and then walk slowly. But after they have learned to walk they don't need a rope, they let go, because if they keep doing that what happens? They become dependent on it and it becomes a hindrance. Let's say you are walking and you are using a walking stick. Each step you take you put down your walking stick and then you take another step and you put your walking stick down again. If you are very weak and you walk very slowly it is very useful and helpful but when you have learned to run and you try to do that, to take a step and put down your walking stick and then take another step and put it down again, can you do that? If you try to do that you have to slow down. So, you just put the walking stick away. It was useful but now it is not necessary. You need to be very skillful in the way you practice. For a beginner it is useful breathing in, breathing out, labeling, breathing in, breathing out, it is very useful because your mind is so scattered and agitated. To keep your mind on one breath is difficult, so you use the word to bring your mind back again and again to breathing. After you have learned to stay with the breath, let go of this long breathing in, just use and out. After a while let go of that even. No need to say anything anymore. For a beginner there are many ways of developing some concentration and awareness. As I told you before, even in one breath you say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to 10. Try to do that. As you breathe in you count in your mind, the minimum 5 and the maximum 10. Why do you do that? Because you want to keep your mind on breathing, breath after breath. If you don't do that, one second you are aware of it and another second you are away, thinking of something else. In order not to go away, not to think of something else you try to count. 
so, it is useful for a beginner. After a while you do not need to count. You don't need to name. You don't need to do anything anymore. Just be with the breath. As you are meditating, you'll feel sensations in your body. Sometimes you feel hot, sometimes you feel cold, sometimes tingling sensation, sometimes just pain. When the sensation becomes very strong, naturally your mind goes to that sensation. You cannot stop it from going there. When it goes there, be with it, no problem. Vipassana can change object. As long as you are aware of the object, as long as you don't think, it is okay. That is why Vipassana concentration it is called Kanika Samadhi, it is translated as momentary concentration. Momentary concentration means that the object changes, but the concentration is still there. One object lasts for a few moments, and you are with that object, it disappears and your mind is on another object, which lasts for a few moments, for a moment actually and you are with that too. Momentary concentration does not mean that you are aware of it only for a moment. That your concentration lasts only for a moment. It means that your concentration is moment, 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 moment. It goes on like that, without any break. Without any break means without getting distracted. That is Kanika Samadhi. When any kind of very strong and obvious sensation happens, whether it is a sound, whether it is a pain, be with it, no problem. When you meditate whatever is happening right now is the object of your meditation, not what happened before or what will happen next. This is a very good example, on a rainy cloudy day and there is thunder all the time, if you go out and look at the sky, once in a while you see a flash, and it lasts for a few seconds and disappears. You cannot tell what shape it will be. When it happens you are aware of it. When it is not there, it is not there anymore and you don't have to think about it. Be ready, be present and objects will come. And you are aware of them. Don't expect what will happen next. Don't try to create experience. Don't make your meditation experience better. But be with whatever is happening, completely. That is the most important aspect of meditation. To be with whatever is. We cannot sit all the time. Our body needs to move, needs some exercise, change of posture, it is very important, because Buddha said, when you keep your body in one position for too long I don't know how long is too long, it depends on the person it becomes painful and when the body becomes painful, unbearable, the mind gets agitated, when the mind gets agitated there is no calmness or peacefulness. There is no samadhi anymore and without samadhi no insight, no insight no liberation. When the pain becomes unbearable you don't have to be with it. Change your posture. When you change your posture do it very mindfully. From sitting you want to move a little bit, you can do that. Slowly move and as you move you can see the pain getting less and less. Feel that pain getting less and less, don't change your posture immediately, without being aware of the changing and lessening of the pain. If you do that there is a gap you are not aware of, not mindful of. When there is pain in your limbs, your mind does not like it. You want to get rid of it. This is the habit but actually it is useful as well because if you don't do something about it you might hurt yourself. For example, when we pick up something very hot we immediately let go of it, because if we don't do that it will burn. This is a kind of survival reaction that we have learnt. When sitting and meditating we know that there is no real danger. When you experience pain. As long as you can be with the pain to endure it. See how your mind reacts. This is a very important learning process. Buddha gave a very deep and profound teaching, although my body is in pain my mind is not in pain, Acharakaya Sami Sato, Siddhama Naturam Bhavis Sati SN 3.1. This is something you should practice. We cannot really get rid of all the pain in our body. As you grow older and older you know that you have to live with pain. People have arthritis, there is no way you can run away from pain. If you take too much medicine it will destroy your liver, kidneys and many other things. If you want to take medication it is okay, that is not what I am saying. 
For normal pain it is not going to hurt you very much, so, try to be with the pain and see how the mind reacts. In some cases, we try to move not because the pain is unbearable but because we are restless. We move because we are not in the habit of being in touch with the pain. When you feel pain, without thinking of pain, without even using the word pain, although in the beginning you can use the word pain, but I have noticed that when you use the word pain it becomes more painful, because you are interpreting it as pain. Pain is something that you don't like. So automatically you react to the word pain. If you stop using the word pain and just get into the pain, be with the pain. You'll find that it is very interesting. Your mind can stay there for a long time. Some of my friends, who are very scared of pain, don't want to meditate because they think it will be very painful. Slowly and slowly they have learned how to meditate and after a while they come in touch with the pain and stay with it, and found out that it becomes very interesting. They get absorbed in the pain. If you are willing to be with the pain. It is not so unbearable, if you are unwilling it. Becomes more and more unbearable. It is the way that your mind looks at experience. Whenever you feel pain, be with it, it will not kill you, actually. When you find that this is my limit and I can't really go on sitting like this anymore, move very slowly, move a few millimeters and see the pain getting less, the whole experience, and the mind also. When the pain gets a little bit less your mind becomes a little bit relaxed, oh. It is nice now, feeling better now, then move a little bit again, feeling better now. Move again, and then you find another position where you don't feel pain anymore, you feel happy, you feel very relaxed and then you continue to meditate, sitting for an hour or sometimes even for two hours. In Burma some people sit for five, six hours and some people sit even more than that you may not believe it. Some people sit for 24 hours without eating or drinking. When I see people that can't even sit for one hour, if they want they can train their body, but they think that they cannot do more than this. When you think that this is your limit, when you come to that point, your body reacts too much. When you know that I can do more than this, your mind does not react. Slowly you can learn to stretch your limit. After you can sit for three hours you find that meditation can get very deep, very, very deep. It becomes more and more clear. You stop thinking, you get deeper and deeper in touch with the reality and you can see very fine subtle things happening. It is important to learn to sit longer and also to do standing meditation. Here I don't see people standing. I see people sitting on the floor or sitting on a chair. Try to meditate standing for a while but if you are afraid that you will fall down, try to put your hands on a rail or a table that will help you to keep balance. Sometimes it is very good to do standing meditation. Stand as long as you can and then you walk and when you walk also do it very mindfully. Begin from the intention to walk. When you stand for a long time, your body really wants to change the posture. You really want to move and that intention is very strong. You can't stand anymore. You don't want to stand anymore. Feel that energy, the energy of wanting to move. Sometimes you feel like your body is moving although your feet are not. You feel like your body is pulling, something is pulling. You can feel that energy in the mind and in the body. The moment that your mind thinks of moving, immediately something happens in your body. That part of the body that is going to move becomes very different. All the nerves and the muscles become immediately ready to move. You feel the energy there, the blood, the nerves and muscles becoming tense and when you become aware of that you let go of it. After a while, a few seconds, that desire, that urge to move comes back again and you know that desire coming, you feel something rushing up and then after a few times you really decide to move. When you move, move very slowly and see the feeling, the sensation, the tension, you feel something happening in your muscles. Get in touch with the feeling, not the shape, you say. Walking, 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 for a beginner it is okay. Here you are not beginners. This is a class for advanced meditators but I want to go back to the beginner stages also. When you say left, right, left, right, it is just words. 
You call this right and you call this left, it is just a name and you are also aware of the shape, this long and round leg, moving forward, stretching and moving again. For a beginner it is okay. After a while it is not the shape, it is not the name, it is the sensation while you move, it is the sensation which should be the object of meditation. How do you feel in your muscles, and also how do you feel in the mind? When you try to do it very mindfully you'll find that even to move you think a little bit and you need the cooperation of your whole body, without the cooperation of your body and mind you cannot move even an inch. Let's say you are standing there and you have decided to move, what is happening? You shift the body weight onto the other leg, that leg has got to take the whole body weight and to feel the cooperation between the two legs. To move it is not very simple. There is a very complex process going on. Get interested. Do not be in a hurry to do anything. What you are doing is to see what is happening in your body when you take just one step. Do it with deep interest. What is happening now? If you do that you can get very interested and because of the interest the mind becomes calm and absorbed. Because of this absorption, samadhi, you also feel more energy. Sometimes a kind of joy too, because joy is very close to interest. If you have no interest, you have no joy. One translation of T is interest. So, get very interested. What happens if I try to move? See what happens to the whole body and mind, before you move even. If you do that and let's say you walk from here to there, do it very slowly. You can get very absorbed. S. Amati can become very strong. Some people say that walking meditation is not good because you don't develop samadhi. Maybe that person has not tried to walk with deep interest. If you do it with a deep interest, you develop very strong samadhi. Buddha said that the samadhi that you develop from practicing walking meditation is much stronger than the samadhi you develop while you are sitting. Kankamadhigato Samadhi Sirathitakohodian 3.30 this is very important to know, because in the moving process, when you can stay with it, your awareness is stronger. When you change posture, when you hear, you see, try to be in touch with the whole process as much as you can, without thinking about it. In that process you will find that there is the intention, the decision, the desire, the wanting arising in your mind, the wanting to move, wanting to see, wanting to listen, wanting to drink. Sometimes you are sitting and meditating and you feel so thirsty, you want to drink, that desire is very strong. You feel the desire, sometimes you see a glass of water, and it would be so nice to drink a glass of water. Sometimes you are sitting and you feel itching somewhere in the body, you want to scratch. Before you scratch you can see the wanting to scratch. Once you have decided to move your hand, before doing it you will feel very different. Feel the change in energy in the hand, something is happening there. In your mind image you also see your hand moving but your real hand has not moved yet. Become aware of all this. Move slowly, scratch and slowly put back your hand and continue meditating. What I am explaining now is actually extremely simple. But it is hard to do simple things. We make things more and more complicated. To meditate is very simple, can you do that? Are you willing to be simple? Now I will give you a chance to ask questions. When I spoke about consciousness and object it is actually Namar Paparikitanana, the first insight, no being, no name, no shape, just sensation and awareness. You know that there is a sensation and there is awareness. Sensation is nature, natural phenomena, and awareness is also natural phenomena. This consciousness is not a being. You are not creating it. It is happening because of the conditions. When you see the two things very clearly that is the first insight. I'll try to talk about the first four insights again and again to get them very clear, I don't want to leave anything out. After the fourth the rest is quite simple. There are ten insights, the first four are the most important ones. Awareness of object and consciousness. Seeing them as natural phenomena, not a being. Not a man not a woman, this is the first insight. Question and answer. 
Buddha talked about walking meditation and said that it gives you samadhi and it is very strong, because you are moving all the time, you need to have more energy, you need to put in more energy to be in touch with the process. When something is stable it is easier to be with it and you can just relax. When something is changing and moving you have to put more effort, more energy into it and once you have developed that sort of energy, effort, and developed that sort of mindfulness and you go and sit, it is quite simple and easy. If you do that yourself, you will find why. If you have a place where you can walk 10 steps it is enough to do walking meditation, because each step will take a long time. Do it with deep interest and then you go and sit mindfully and see what happens. You'll get calmer, more peaceful, and more mindful. I suggest that you do walking meditation first and then do sitting meditation, you'll really feel the difference. For beginners it is very important to do both. But as you develop deeper and deeper samadhi, after a while you can sit for two hours and walk for one hour. And after a while you sit for three hours and walk for one hour just to give your body some exercise and you can get deeper and deeper in your samadhi. Question and Answer In the section of Satipatthana, there is one section about walking meditation and if you can find the commentary of that section it will give you more detailed instructions. Question and Answer The sensitivity of the body, the skin actually, also deep in the muscles you feel something. Whatever you feel on your body you feel it because of the sensitivity of the body. Sensitivity of the eyes, sensitivity of the ear, sensitivity of the nose, the nose is sensitive to smell, the tongue is sensitive to taste, the eye is sensitive to light and colors, the ear is sensitive to sound vibration, the body is sensitive to hot or cold, hard soft, movement, vibration, tension. Question and answer. Yes. Vedananupasana means you are aware of the pain, not only pain, Sukhavedana, Dukkavedana and Upekhavedana. What I am saying is that you are with the pain but you are not naming it anymore. In the beginning you are naming it, but after a while you don't name it anymore, you are with the pain, whether it is Dukkha, painful, Sukha, pleasant, or Upekha, neutral, you are with the pain. Being with the pain is Vedananupasana you are doing it without naming it. Question and answer. I see, three kinds of Vedana, in the body you feel all three, Dukkha, Sukha and also Apekha. Most of the time there is some sort of light pain in the body all the time, but we don't pay attention. When we pay attention we feel it. When there is no pain anymore you feel very light. Sometimes in meditation you feel so peaceful and calm and so light, all the pain is gone that is Sukhavedana. Sometimes there is Upekhavedana, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. In the eye, for the sensitivity of the eye, the Vedana is only Upekha. For the smell also, the smell comes into your nose you don't really feel pain there. You are aware of the smell only, so there is no Sukha or Dukkha. When you smell something terrible, your body and mind reacts to it, which is another process. One of my friends had an accident and after that he couldn't smell anything anymore. He might be working in a place with very bad smell but he does not react. Question and answer. You feel more weight on another leg? Heaviness you mean, when you lift. Because it has weight you have to overcome gravity, you have to overcome the resistance, and you have to put in some effort to lift it. You know, we are so used to moving that we don't really know how much effort it takes. To give you an example, a long time ago, we friend agreed to arrange a situation where one of us could meditate without doing anything at all for a month. It meant we just put out the bowl in front of the door, closed the door and sat and meditated. A monk took away the bowl, put in the food, and filled up all the water pots, cleaned everything and brought them back and left the bowl there. When we felt ready to eat, we opened the door, took the bowl and ate. Nobody would come and disturb us. We did that for a long time, just sitting and meditating many hours and just going out to get exercise, walking for a few minutes only to stretch your legs and then come back and continue to meditate. The eyes just dropping, the whole body becomes so relaxed that after a while it is difficult even to open your eyes. It takes so much effort to open the eyelids, you need so much energy to open your eyes. 
When we started talking again, you needed to develop so much energy just to talk. The cheek muscles also became so soft, even smiling is so difficult. We are so used to this burden that we do not really know what it takes. Question and answer. Not really, actually. In the beginning, if you do that for a few months and you start thinking, you find that it is difficult to think. It is only for a while, because we do it again and again. When I lived in my place in Myanmar, I lived there alone for at least four months. When you come out of that in the beginning it is a little bit difficult, because you don't want to think. It is not necessary to think. But when you have to say something, you know exactly what to say without going around. You stay short and to the point, you are clear. When you want to say something you get in touch with what you want to say and say it very clearly. Also, before we meditate we take these names, ideas, and associations very seriously but after. You meditate you know that these are just interpretations and don't take them very seriously. But you know the meaning. You interpret in the same way, in the right way, you use it appropriately without taking it too seriously. You use it without being imprisoned by the concepts, ideas, and names. Concepts, idea, names, are prisons, they are useful but they are also prisons. If we really want to free our mind, we have to know what the limitations are. This is one form of reality. It is important for our survival, if we don't interpret things in the right way we will not survive. In the evolutionary process we have learned to interpret things in the right way. Especially in the forest, you are sitting there and you hear something, if you don't interpret it the right way you'll be eaten up by a tiger. When you hear a tiger you just shut the door. If you keep it open maybe you'll be in trouble. To interpret things in the right way is useful but when you want to go beyond ordinary reality, you need to leave all that behind. Question and answer. Yes, that is true. If you can do that it is very useful to develop deep insight. For beginners I would not suggest doing that, because it is better to develop gradually. If suddenly you ask a person go and live in that cave, in a small room, don't come out, we will bring food, stay there for four months, that person will go crazy. We are always trying to run away from ourselves. We can't face what is inside. There are so many things inside, all sorts of memories, emotions, feelings, and desires, so much inside. If you suddenly do that, everything will explode. Gradually learn to do that. It is not easy to be with yourself all the time. If you have learned to live with yourself, just watch and let go, without reacting. You can develop very deep samadhi and very deep insight. Question and answer. It comes naturally actually. You don't have to deliberately do anything. It happens. If you can just do one thing, honestly. Be aware of what is happening without misinterpreting anything. The rest will happen. That is the beauty of the practice. You know that if I am mindful honestly. The rest will happen naturally. Whatever difficulty comes into your mind, if you can be aware of that difficulty, a question comes into your mind. I don't know what to do, be aware of that question and let go. If you can do that your mind becomes calm again. After a while you know what to do, you find out what to do without thinking. Many people when they practiced with my teacher kept coming and asking one question after another. He was very patient, very kind, and he answered every question but after a while he said be more mindful, you'll find your own answers. That is really very important, because now he has passed away, who is going to answer the questions? The real name of my teacher is Venerable Damanandaya. Question and answer. Yes, when you become very, very mindful, your mind sometimes cannot think especially when you develop some sort of samadhi and insight, although you try to divert your mind to another object it will not go there, it will come back. What do you do? Just leave it. Stay there for a while and after when you feel ready to do other things, do them. When the mind is not ready to do it, don't force it. It is something like a hypnotic state. When you are in a hypnotic state you should not come out quickly. 
it is a kind of absorption so take your time and slowly come out of it. In Vipassana also you can get very absorbed. When you are in that state, don't force yourself to come out quickly. Take your time. A few minutes are enough. Just prepare your mind to come out of it. Thinking is a burden. If you are very calm and peaceful, if there is no thought, no agitation, it is okay to stay there. It is so nice to go away from the world.